So I think a lot of people here have heard the term samadhi before, meaning uh, often translated as concentration, and usually uh, bringing to mind the idea of bringing the attention to a single point, furrowing one's brow, uh, sort of a linear gaze forward. And I think it's uh, really useful to return to what the idea might have meant a little more at the time of the Buddha, this idea of concentration, uh, unification of heart. And rather than thinking of uh, how we so often concentrate in the modern era, which is in a linear fashion using the eyes, such as to, to read, one can imagine being a meditator uh, at the time of the Buddha in the forest surrounded by darkness and conditions and wild animals and the sort of intense sensitivity and lucidity of the body towards the entire scope around one, all 360 degrees. And this idea of attentiveness it's also worth thinking of how the Brahma gods are portrayed in Buddhist cosmology. In the Buddhist cosmos, every deity, every station is a correlate to a mind state. And the Brahma gods are correlates to the jhanas, the uh, deep states of samadhi, of concentration. And the Brahma gods are portrayed as having four faces, one on each, uh, well, side of their head, and they are portrayed as luminous, and they are portrayed as looking down on immense world systems. It's said that the finger of one Mahabrahma illuminates a whole world system. The uh, Brahma gods of the second jhana level are said their light flickers like a torch, and the Brahma gods of the third level glow like the moon. So the picture we get of what the Buddha meant when he noted and spoke about samadhi, jhana, is not a single constricted point, but rather a broad, open, but unified awareness that is lucid, that is bright, that is vast. And mindfulness of breathing, when it's cultivated uh, skillfully, allows this idea of concentration of samadhi, of jhana, to manifest in just such a lucid, broad, relaxed manner. A few weeks ago, I spoke about uh, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing, as uh, using the analogy of a violin, um, where the bow of the breath is drawn up and down the central channel of the body. Um, but at times, one may find it, themselves attracted to one point, such as the tip of the nose, and then also to be attentive to uh, a music or another kind of note that might manifest, such as metta, loving kindness. But honestly, it, that's pretty, con it's a lot. So let's come back to basics, I think. Um, because I think this uh, metaphor actually treads on two really dangerous areas for moderns when we practice anapanasati, and that's the tendency to constrict awareness. Um, often our minds and awarenesses are already constricted, uh, brittle, shallow, and the proclivity towards doubt, which is crippling for so many moderns. So giving one all these options and all the difficulty and confusion that can lead to I read a book recently called Breathing Like a Buddha, or Breathing Like the Buddha, Breathing Like a Buddha, by Longpur Suchitto. And it's the most uh, succinct and articulate description of mindfulness of breathing, or Anapanasati practice I've ever read. Um, I really recommend it. It just came out. It's free online. It's a PDF. Breathing like a Buddha. Uh, it's brief. And in it, Longpur Suchitto um, 
really simplifies things in a way I think is helpful. In that, uh, of the metaphor I just gave, what he really leaves is the bow. Rather than having a, a home base be a certain point, which seems to, so often with moderns, lead to a staleness and constrictedness of mind, the central reference point is rather a central axis of the body, the spine or maybe just in front of the spine, up and down the body from the crown of the head, center of the brain, throat, navel, and then just below the navel. And the idea that the breath energy, pana in uh, Pali, prana in Sanskrit, chi in the Taoist conception, uh, the breath was not just air in the time of the Buddha. It was a subtle energy which ran and runs through the body. And that although this pana flow for many of us is currently constricted and stale and uh, has whirlpools here and there and maybe there's some crocodiles hiding, it's when uh, cleaned out, when um, nourished and channeled and cultivated, the flow of that breath energy actually composes a body inside the body. Um, one image from the suttas applied to something slightly different, but it, it works here, is a uh, blade of grass drawn out of its sheath. And by tapping into this conception of the breath body uh, and becoming skilled at accessing it, at uh, relieving and relaxing blockages, we gain access to a deep source of nourishment, of energy, of pleasure, an internal wealth and brightness. This is the practice of anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. So in the sutta, uh, which is, I think, Majjhima Nikaya 118, um, at least one of the versions, is one begins uh, by sitting erect, um, sets one's body erect. And that phrase so often passed over is, is absolutely essential. The idea of having an upright spine, uh, you'll find makes an enormous difference in your meditation and in the ability of the energy to not get blocked as you cultivate this practice. Other analogies the Buddha gives for mindfulness of the body include, um, he speaks about uh, the six sense bases, eyes, taste, hearing, etc., as six animals, a crocodile, a monkey, um, etc. And usually they're all tied to one another, dragging each other around here and there. But when one cultivates mindfulness of the body, it's as if one has uh, planted a firm stake in the ground and then tied all the animals to it so that they get exhausted and lie down next to that stake, next to that pillar. So this is the pillar, this central axis, from the ground to the heaven. After setting one's body erect, the uh, sutta instructs one to, one knows thus, um, or one knows breathing in long, one knows I breathe in long. Breathing out long, one knows I breathe out long. Breathing in short, one knows I breathe in short. Breathing out short, one knows I breathe out short. So, one of the tools we'll be using in Anapanasati is something called Vitaka Vichara, uh, directed thought and evaluation. This is a component the Buddha identified in Samadhi, it's called a, a jhana factor. And what it means is directing the mind and then listening, directing and sensing. The analogy given in the commentaries is one rings a bell and then listens to its resonance. So what this means in terms of our practice is we direct the mind and then we step back and taste and feel how our intention affected uh, the mind and body. 
So often a direct instruction will be too harsh and um, domineering for an already traumatized organism that we are. So often what is most helpful for establishing this whole view and field of the body is just asking oneself, how do I feel the breathing now? What breathing feels good? And then let the body respond. Let it, how do you feel the breathing? Where do you feel the breathing? And over time, you may find that really what does form out of that is this conception of the central axis and the breath coming up and down, at least at first. But in the beginning, you may feel the breath otherwise. You may feel it constricted. You may feel it in the face, um, in the nose. And just to know that this is how you feel the breath right now. And as one uh, tries to cultivate this whole field of the breath, this movement up and down, one really may begin to notice blockages. Uh, this is very common. Um, one of the, two of the places that are often most problematic for people are the top of the head, um, or not the top of the head, the forehead, the face, the jaw area, and then also the diaphragm and the belly. So when one senses that tension, the response one can have is not to go straight into it, but rather to hold it in and embrace a canopy of awareness. Just place awareness gently, softly around it. And then from that place, ask, okay, how do I feel the breathing? And what that will do is it will invite your body to remind you of that rhythm of the breath again. And as you hold awareness near that and around that spot of tension, that natural rhythm of the breathing that's also in your awareness will soften it as if it's massaging. And you can make a very conscious movement towards expanding that canopy towards parts of the body which are more comfortable, which are more grounded. And those don't necessarily have to be right next to that place. For example, a tension in your belly or diaphragm, you might hold it in awareness, but then notice that it's not all that hard to imagine your feet connected to that space, that connection. And just ask, how do I feel the breathing now? And sort of integrate it or stroke it along that same up and down of the breath. If there's a tension in your head and face, it really may be useful to hold a canopy of awareness over that area or a bubble. And then just sweep or expand awareness down the spine to the kidneys, uh, expand it to the palms, hold and connect that tension to the parts of your body which feel safe and grounded and calm and soft. And then invite yourself to breathe again. How do I feel the breath? And allow that space to massage and hopefully soften. After which you can return to that natural whole body flow of the breath. Again, your home base, the central axis. What's significant here is in the commentaries, often what you'll, and in modern instruction, you'll often be told to track the breath at one point. But what's so useful about this approach is we don't care about spatial continuity. It doesn't matter remaining at one point in the body. What we care about is temporal continuity because that's what the sutta directs us to know. Know if you're breathing in long or short. Know if you're on the exhale, the inhale, or in between but exactly, quote unquote, where your awareness is, whatever that sort of means, isn't a necessary factor.
factor through the entirety of this. So what that means is, yes, it's useful to get this feel of the whole body through the central axis, but then you really can play around. So if you do find you want to expand that canopy over a point of tension in your head, you can imagine a bubble of breath expanding and contracting around the upper half of your body, massaging the breath in. And as long as that bubble is expanding and contracting with your breathing, that's fine because you know the breath temporally. You're knowing if you're on the inhale and the ex exhale. And exactly where your awareness is placed or what your visualization is doesn't matter. So you can use it very skillfully. Similarly, you can... Um, there are sort of two main ways of releasing these points of tension. One is to hold a uh, bubble of or canopy of awareness around them. So once again, that can, you know, in the chest, you could imagine a sort of bright, soft bubble of light expanding and contracting with the breath. And then expand it outwards, and you could feel connecting it to your arms, your elbows. And you can even imagine two kind of uh, balls of breath, say, under each arm, expanding and contracting just connecting that point of tension to these points of groundedness and relaxation. Similarly, you might find um, the palms can be a really grounding element. So you can imagine that same awareness connecting a point of tension to the palms and imagine holding two balls of breath in them and expanding and contracting. So that's one method is the canopy uh, encompassing and relaxing and smoothing out a point of tension. And the other is to imagine sweeping. So another way you can relax attention is if you find, say, tension in the head, imagine the breath energy, a white, bright light, sweeping down the back of the head, sweeping all the tension down, uh, out the, you know, down the right side of the spine, out one leg and out the foot. And then you can breathe back in the foot, come up and back to the top of the head. Or you can imagine the breath energy moving down to the top of the head, uh, down through the back of the spine, out over the shoulders, out through the fingers, and then back up. And this sweeping technique is another really useful way of relaxing and stroking these points of tension into calm. One thing to keep a watch for, though, is that through all of this, vitaka vichara, directed thought and evaluation, we tend to be such doing creatures. And this is not a practice of doing. It is a practice of, there's some doing, there's some directing, but it's largely receptivity. So rather than, you know, notice if you're controlling the experience too much, if you're saying, okay, bubble, breathe in, bubble, breathe out, you know, or up the spine, down the front, or up, down, up, down, and just step back and move back to an invitation. How does this feel? Or if there's a point of tension, say, in your head or chest, just say head, chest, calm, and then stop and just listen. See how the body reacts to that. So back to the steps is the first step when breathes in long, knowing I breathe in long, breathes out long, knowing I breathe out long. When breathes in short, knowing I breathe in short. When breathes out short, knowing I breathe out short. And what this refers to is that as these breath knots, as these points of turbulence and blockage and whirlpool in the breath energy relax and you come back again and again, to this natural flow and rhythm, you may really find that the breath is relaxing. It's slowing down. It's lengthening. One breathes in long. So let it lengthen. And you can even invite it, just gently invite it to lengthen and slow. But what you also might notice is after that happens, after the diaphragm has relaxed, after the body has become a bit more at ease. That there's a moment where the breath ends on the exhale. And before the breath begins again on the inhale, 
that space begins to feel like it can hold you a bit more. And there's less urge to rush the inhale. And what you find is those breaks in the breath between the inhale and exhale or exhale and inhale are windows into this more subtle breath energy that has very little to do with how your lungs are moving. So what you'll find is as you tune and touch those points between the breath, they hold you more. You might even notice a kind of light associated with them. On the space between the inhale and exhale, when you're full, you might notice a brightening. And on the exhale, at the end of that, a calming, dawn and dusk. And as that happens, the actual breath moving in and out may slow, um, may become more subtle, and actually shorten. But not shorten out of tension, but rather shorten because you're resting and working with a subtle form of uh, the breath energy. So this is, the, uh, this is why it starts long and then it moves to short. The next step is one breathes in and out, becoming sensitive to the whole body, training thus. And a real issue with moderns is how constricted we are into our heads. So finding an expedient means to sweep awareness to the rest of the body. One method I really recommend is Qigong. Um, there's a series of five standing pose call, poses called Zhuang Zhang. And it's uh, standing like a tree pose, if you look it up. That pose alone, it's a standing pose, but it'll clarify and drop the breath into the torso and the awareness, and you will be less stuck in your head. And the other one, of course, is cold water. I really recommend cold showers. If you can combine the qigong and the cold showers, that's especially good. And this can be helpful along with yoga or whatever skillful technique you find drops you into the body. But one issue is even though this invitation to move up and down with the breath energy in the body can be helpful, often it's not enough and you find your mind wanting to do more. And when that happens, it's okay to do a kind of brief scan of the body. So imagining the breath or the uh, awareness in this upper bubble of, uh, uh, from the neck up to above the head and imagining breathing there for a time and then bringing it down here, breathing in the torso, the second chamber, from, and then the third chamber from the navel to the tailbone, breathing there for a time, and then expanding back to that up and down flow. And that's just a brief allowing the mind to kind of run around the body and become sensitive. It's useful. This is how I become aware of the whole body. And when one does this, the, um, you know, if you keep coming back to this invitation to be with the breath up and down that central axis of the spine um, or of the central, sorry, axis, over time, this flow of the breath will become very vibrant and uh, palpable. And it will lead to these steps which come later involving uh, refreshment, involving pleasure. But the point is when you tune into that breath body, um, there's a real sense of uh, refreshment that comes from it, of nourishment. And this is uh, often accompanied as that breath smooths um, with what we call a nimitta. And often it'll be a, you know, for some people it'll manifest as a light or a sense of beauty or a softness at the nostrils. Whatever it is, just rest in the coolness, but stay with the breath too. Keep the breath there. And what this practice does is it provides us with an internal wealth. The body becomes strong through movement. The mind becomes strong through stillness. And as we tune into this flow of energy through the body, we suddenly find that we have an internal source of well-being that is not dependent on feeding off of the senses, off of circumstance. The Brahma gods are said to be nourished by bliss, fe feeding on bliss. 
whereas all the realms below them are feeding off of the five chords of sensual pleasure, the sights, sounds, tastes, touch. And granted, we have refined modes of those. You know, we have good experiences with family, we go hiking. But it's useful to recollect that the Buddha spoke about three kinds of happiness, amisa sukha, worldly happiness, happiness of the flesh, of the pleasure, of uh, the senses, uh, and then amisa sukha, which is spiritual happiness, and then nibbana, third type of happiness, which is unconditioned. And what we're doing is acknowledging that that first sort of happiness, everything predicated on external conditions, is fragile. It's fragile. When the body goes, when we get sick, when the spouse doesn't behave like we would like them to, when the job doesn't go like we w would want it to, we find that a source of nourishment is cut off and we only realize how attached we are, how much we are feeding off of those things when they're compromised. And you know what that despair looks like. So by cultivating this internal source of wealth and brightness, samadhi, jhana, one gains access to the second level of happiness, amisa, sukha, spiritual pleasure. And that is a non-fragile happiness, and it's far more sublime. It's a happiness where if the body goes, if you get put in you know, a hospital bed, if the marriage isn't going like you would want it to go, you are not bereft, and it prepares you for all that is to come. It's provisions. The thing I also want to say is, you know, for some people, breath meditation will manifest as one, focusing on one point. That does happen, and some people have a proclivity. But to use an analogy, the power of this idea of centering around the spine, the central axis, and allowing this movement, there's an analogy for our daily lives, in that when we focus our spiritual practice in one place, to the exclusion of others, it's a form of spiritual bypass, and many aspects of our lives can go completely unaddressed and unaffected. Um, you know, there's plenty of stories about, you know, you go to retreat, and then you go out drinking, and then you go back to retreat, and then you go out back drinking. And this is, you know, metaphorically, it's like having that one point that you focus on. But the spine, it's a central axis that runs through your life, and we need that structure in our lives. Because there's a uh, term in the canon called uju, which means upright. And there's another term, mudu, which means soft. And somehow we aim for both. We want mudu, soft, in terms of this normalcy, warmth, flourishing. That's a good three words for your metric. At the same time, we need uju. We need uprightness, this alignment of life and our orientation. And, you know, someone was speaking to me last week saying, look, I don't really, you know, I, I feel like I'm becoming dependent on this group in some ways. I feel like I need to kind of pull back and make sure I'm, you know, not becoming dependent on, on something. Uh, this is paraphrasing and, and unfairly at that. But the thing is we need to be dependent on something. We all need a crutch and we all have a trellis uh, which we grow on and making sure that's a wholesome one. So really firmly establishing that orientation, that upright axis in your lives around very concrete practices, um, you know, in terms of your time. So are you getting at least 20 minutes of meditation in a day? That's basic hygiene, once again. Uh, if you can, can you do two sits a day, evening and morning? Can you fit five or 10 minutes sit into a lunch break at some point? Can you take one day a week and put it aside for practice as a new post-it today, where you turn off the media and really give yourself to what's most important? Can the first thing you do in the morning be to bow? And the last thing you do in the evening be to bow to some symbol of what you consider most high. Because we all bow to something. And if you don't think you're bowing to something, you, it might be you're bowing to yourself or your stomach or your career, but you're bowing to something. 
And when we bow to this image, it's just an image, but it's a symbol of something beautiful and the potential for awakening. And if life does not align along those lines, if we don't keep ourselves uju, aligned, upright, straight, and hold each other to that, then you know how it feels when life dilutes itself. You know how it feels when you're not living the life you know that you are, are worthy of and which you're meant to live. So this is what this community can do, is together hold a high standard of uh, orienting ourselves towards what's actually meaningful. And you find that that's not contradictory to a suppleness, to a softness, to a gentleness. Yes, we come once a week and gather and sit. And yes, we encourage people to practice diligently. And the warmth that surrounds that structure and is held by it is undeniable. And in this way, we encounter a Dhamma that is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, and beautiful in the end. And we begin to cultivate an internal source of happiness in the body and in the body of this community, which can sustain through uh, trial and old age and everything else that is to come. So uh, good luck with that. Thanks, everyone. I'm, I was a little hesitant to give another talk on the breath, but I felt like the other metaphor might have been a bit much. And honestly, this book by Longfor Suchito, I think, is the best, the best rundown I've ever seen of Anapanasati. I really recommend people read it. Breathing Like a Buddha. It's free online, the PDF. Um, yeah. So we have time for questions or comments or talking now. So uh, we have a mindful Mike Walker. and. If people on Zoom want to raise their electronic hand, they can, and we can call on you to speak. But does anyone have anything they'd like to bring up? I have a question, actually. Um, so during the meditation, like towards the middle, paying attention to the breath almost promotes a state of relaxation to the point where there's more visuals happening, not, not so much thoughts, but visuals. And I'm just curious what our relationship with those should be. Is that another distraction that we need to draw back to the breath, or is that promoting something good, I guess? What sort of visuals were they, if I can ask? Um, colors. Mm. And were they moving quickly, or? Yes. OK. Often when the mind begins to relax, it's almost like you're unkinking a bunch of pipes and a lot of stuff begins to come up, especially when you're getting really close to what they call upachar samadhi or neighborhood concentration. And a lot of strange like visions will start to come up or you know, you'll begin to feel like the hands are really heavy or your body will feel like it's expanding. These are all kind of signs of approach to calm. Um, generally, just let it be, it's kind of, weird, but don't give attention to it too much. Like, stay with the breath. Um, but you don't have to, like, shut it out of awareness. Just don't get involved. A distinction can be made with that, and some visuals which can arise are this nimitta, which we talked about, the sign that can come when the body's really becoming calm. And for a lot of people, that'll be a light. Um, for others, Ajahn, Je uh, Ajahn Brahm talks about breath meditation as first you're with the breath, then you're with the beautiful breath, then you're just with the beautiful so for some people, it can be like actually just a sense of coolness or, or beauty. And that's okay to give a, more attention to. It's, you don't have to, you never leave the breath completely, but you can allow it to, to really be there a bit more if it's a visual like that. Yeah. If, if visuals ever get too much, often being in the head will invoke them. And you can drop your chin and drop awareness to the heart and then expand out. And often that'll get rid of the visuals um, if they're coming from the head too much. Um, <clears throat> one of the daily uh, qu 
quotes I get recently stated that if you're sitting there to meditate, then you're meditating. And I think of that sometimes when uh, I'm sitting, but I'm full of stale feelings, and that's between me and metta, loving kindness. Um, I don't expect to uh, feel some, I'd like to buy the world a Coke feeling every time I sit down <laughs> to meditate. But lately, <laughs> I've just been sitting, and there's just been a block of stale <laughs> humanity. Um, and I feel like I'm just taking it off my list, and mm. I'm happy to do it. Meditation is a privilege, not a punishment, as I remind myself when it seems like a punishment. But I guess my question is just, I know we just continue through this staleness and just doing some kind of loving kindness by rote rather than truly feeling it, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts or encouragement or, thank you. What's your name? Tamson. Tams oh, sorry. I, okay. Um, thank you for that question. I love the bio world of Coke feeling. That I've never heard that phrase before. The bio world of Coke feeling. I've never heard that phrase. It's a good phrase. Uh, it's okay. It's a good one. <laughs> we monks date ourselves by our pop culture references all the time. So. <laughs> so. No, I, I think. That's a really good question. And um, I think it really is one of the problems with how meditation's been taught, is you're given one root and one thing, and if it stops working, which it will, almost certainly, especially a per an applied perception like metta, you know, the kalesas, the defilements will block it, they'll figure it out. And um, then you're kind of told just keep at it until someday something will pop. But Ajahn Jeff, I think, says, uh, has a really good saying where he's like, you have to think like a thief um, in terms of being crafty. And um, that's hard to do when all you have is one tool and one kind of meta tool. And, and I think one of the real powers of engaged, full, embodied breath meditation is it's such a robust tool like there's almost always some way of working with the breath that will, will work, where you can get around the defilements. So, you know, a blockage in, say, the chest or something, a point of staleness. Um, you know, you really may find that you can imagine the breath kind of just on this circuit running around it, and over time it relaxes. Or maybe you find if you kind of touch it with this gentle touch like you would pet an animal, that, that helps. Or um, maybe bringing you know, your mind somewhere else, like placing your awareness more on your, uh, the breath at your head, upper area, like releases it over time. But there's always some way of engaging with the moment that's effective and playful. And it's, the breath meditation like this is so useful because it gives you a really good tool belt for that. So I'd say if you're feeling that staleness, you know, try these, tr try working with these body scan techniques see if you can figure out interesting ways of breaking it open. But also, like, you know, there's, practice can be very broad, and, and it might c happen that what you need to do then is walking meditation too, or a bit of qigong, or take a cold shower, or something like that. Sometimes, <coughs> yeah, sometimes the focusing on an alternative breath technique feels like it's bringing me back too much into this world, w which might be okay. I'm not mm. sure if I'm describing it correctly. I feel like I'm too much back at a desk job or something instead of that nice meditative contemplative space that happens once in a blue moon. But you know what I mean? Sometimes it feels too procedural. Mm. So I don't know, but if that's okay, that's fine. It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, w that's meditation. We power through it sometimes. Wh uh, which which uh, breath technique are you kind of referencing? Specifically, I, just in general, the concept of sitting with meditate towards the end when you're doing opening or closing mm -hmm. um, dedication of merit, that kind of thing. Just going through that, I just feel like I sometimes feel like I'm. Yeah. I don't feel engaged with the underlying basic um, mm. reality. I feel like I'm just reciting a grocery list. You know, oh, okay, meditation's almost over. Let me just finish the dedication. Yeah. Of merit. Anyone else feel like that sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Tansen. No, I, I think that's very common. And um, 
and with small things like a dedication of merit, it's okay because it's, it's sort of a ritual you hold. But for the bulk of your meditation, I think it is really important to experiment and play. And one thing that really works is if a certain technique's not working with you, for you, especially a breath technique, read a slightly different teacher on it. I find that reinvigorates practice. Like if you've been reading Ajahn Brahm, read Shyla Catherine, Wisdom Wide and Deep, or read Ajahn Jeff's Keeping the Breath in Mind, or keep, read Ajahn Suchitto, and you really might find a key there, and that's a huge gift. Um, I find that can reinvigorate stuff, but, but I find the most effective way to work through a lot of that is usually the breath, because it, it is the most robust tool in our tool belt, I think, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think so many of us are in that situation so often. Um, my name is Shelley. Um, so I used to meditate um, in the morning and the evening, and then I decided to do a big meditation in the morning. And my question that I've been thinking about for a while is, would it be useful to start adding minutes in the afternoon or evening? So like, I like the big one in the morning. Would it be useful? I don't know. That yeah, you, do it. Yeah, I knew you were going to yeah. say, why did I even ask this? But I said, okay Coke. to start with like <laughs> something short. Um, and would that make a difference, something short? Huge, huge, yeah. I, um, short meditations through the rest of the day can be unbelievably grounding. Um, you know, some, I think I spoke about this, there was one uh, waiter um, I knew of who every time he went and filled up a water pitcher, he would like take three extra breaths and just that anchoring. And, you know, and, and during a lunch break or something, like 10 minutes in there can make a big difference. Or even like every hour at the desk, see if you can put something down and just come back to your body. Yeah, it makes a huge difference, even a little, like 10 minutes of metta before you fall asleep, you know, it's massive. Yeah. Um, is it okay if I say something about what she was saying? Please, yes. Um, I find a way to break up the meditation is to use a mantra. Mm -hmm. And, and it can really come good. right from a chant or something you've been taught or love, a, like a word. So the mantra is something that I like to put in there too. Thank you, yeah. So I just really resonated with what you said about <clears throat> the having a dependency on something wholesome. Mm -hmm. um, that's just, that's been huge for me because I've been noticing since I've been coming here that that has really, really grown. Mm -hmm. um, and just what an amazing thing that is. I, I don't think that I've ever had that before. And so I just really appreciated that story that you shared, that someone else was sort of thinking maybe that was a bad thing, but actually, no, like, we all deserve that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was trying to nod. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, thank you. And, and I, I think that's, I know someone else is working with it too, and the sense of, you know, noticing the attachment there and the fear and the FOMO and the everything, um, that's, that's good, but... But yeah, communities like this, I just find they're so much more reliable because like we aren't predicating our being together on how well our personalities match. It's like you just care for people here. And uh, yeah, I think if we hold that as a culture, it is safer. It means, yeah, friends and birth aging and death is and the spiritual path, so. Right, yeah, I feel like I know my own Buddha nature better and, and also see it in others. Yeah. Like that's really grown. Thank you. Very glad. Uh, you just um, talked today just about a right this morning that I joined the, the retreat, the friend of um, Messi Banjasi. And she talk about um, uh, she the, the course is anapanasati, it, but um, she said in our our daily life in the busy time now, the breath is very uh, fine, very fine uh, object to concentrate on, 
she had been practiced anapanasati, the breathing a lot. And she said, uh, there is one, one uh, this is a, just a sharing, a technique that um, bring a model person to be concentrated at all time, whatever we're doing, by drinking very, very cold water hmm. and sit. And this technique is found out by one man who's in my mother teacher, I just found out. Then drink it, and then the water will go all the way down to below the navel. And stay there. And she says, stay there, stay there. And for the person, I, I joined this, and I sit, she looked at me, sit, she said, you, you have been practiced anapanasti for a long time. Mm. And you stay there, and when you find your, your mind is calm into the samadhi, maybe begin of the samadhi. And then we, the, uh, she said, the, the, the point, the goal of us is not be calm and peace. She said, we need the mind to be alert to investigate the characteristics, the three characteristics of the system. She said, when the mind alert, we need to investigate that. And you sit there for a long time and you will come. So we don't go beyond this. You will not go beyond this, she said. Now, um, will, you, will you want to do the my, my, um, follow my advice for the try for one month, she said. Hmm. So I drink, we, she guided us to drink the cold water all the way to the below the navel. And remember that, he said, it's the same thing as uh, breathing in from the nose that you talk about the, the violin, the, the beginnings of the nose and all the way down to the, be in, in, instead of uh, concentrate on the, the, the nose tip, you concentrate on the end of the, the breath. Mm. It's the same thing, she said. But because it's core there, whatever you think is like chi poi, Ajahn, when you practice chi gong, it's that poi, she said. Mm. And then, uh, walk more than sit, she said. If you feel like uh, you're, you're stiff and you didn't, you know, she said, get up and walk. Mm. So she gave me, I said, I walk two hours every day. She said, change. Walk two hours every day and sit only 15 minutes. Mm. So now <laughs> I had to get out and she, she cleared up. I walk and walk and it's work. Mm. And it's work because after I walk for one hour and come and sit down, it, the mind is not, um, and then it start, when, when, when the, when the, when the, the puru. Knowing. Yeah, the knowing know in this place, but when, when we see something or even our thought, we, it's kind of distant. Mm -hmm. Or even the, the light that we used to see, she said, that's, you, your sati, have to be balanced with your samadhi to investigate the, the phenomena, the three characteristics of existence. That's what uh, the she, she technique she told me. Mm. Thank you, Ajahn, because the, you talked to just about what uh, Mechi talked about this morning with us. Thank but you. Do you actually drink cold water or do you imagine it's cold water? No, at first we have to drink cold water until we really, really find out the coolness stay there. Okay. And she will ask, you still feeling cold, right? Mm. Meaning cold all the way. There. But if the, the for someone who drink the cold water, have to be very cold, about 500 cc. And if it stay above the navel, she said not finished, not not enough yet. You have to drink another 500 cc. <laughs> yeah, it, it, this is not funny. It's <laughs> we have to <laughs> we we have to practice this. We have to. I still can kind of figure out, but someone can focus on that all the time nowadays. But I can, I can, she said, if you cannot uh, feel it yet, imagine at the moment. So now I have to go with her and she have to guide me to drink that water. Another will be fourth time for me. Mm. But, but it's very, very work because after walking, it's some of the people, but walk not, not just slowly. She said, you have to walk fast and then concentrate on your that, that, that colding point, they call it the cold water point. Mm. Very fast, fast, but when, when the sati touch that, I mean, they come to that point, somehow it bursts up and you walk fast too. It's, it's very interesting mm. yeah, uh, technique to use it. It's just uh, sharing. Thank, Thank you, Ajahn. Thanks, Lady.